Friends, this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Joe Albright, and I want to welcome you to this time of worship for Geneva Presbyterian Church Online. If you are joining us as a visitor, we are delighted to have you. Friends, I invite you now to center your hearts and your minds on Christ as we go to God in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is a gracious God whose mercy is everlasting and whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Let us bring God our hearts, our thanks, and our praise. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares can destroy, be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is balm, be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the As we come before God, one of the first acts of our joyful worship is to name anything that may be separating us from God or from others. Come, children of God, please pray with me. God of love, you have spoken your word to us and in us, but so often we have not listened to you. We have not been mindful of your presence or attentive to your voice. Have mercy on us, O God. Give us open ears and open hearts that we might listen and follow. We humbly offer to you now our silent prayers of confession. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Our scripture for today is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. 
Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life, and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy.
A couple of years ago, Twitter employees sorted through more than 44,000 tweets that referenced the words Lent and giving up. They did this to come up with the most popular things that people were sacrificing for Lent that year. Their top five in order were social networking, alcohol, Twitter itself, chocolate, and interestingly enough, the fifth most popular thing to give up for Lent was Lent itself. <laughs> Do you know that in the original essence of the word, Lent means lengthening? And, and you can think about how this time of year, the days of spring become longer. And nature itself, it sings this song of renewed life and energy and growth. Early on, Lent was seen as a type of spiritual spring, a time for spiritual growth. And so with all this in mind, we're starting a new series of messages this morning titled Reset, Drawing Closer to God. Now, I've been thinking a lot about the impact that this pandemic has had and, and really still having on so many of us. And we're really still in the midst of this, and, and it may be a while before we finally come to grips with how life looks beyond all of this. And you know, I keep thinking, I just can't wait for things to get back to normal. But the more I reflect on it, the more I realize that things are never going to go back exactly as they were before. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, just for one thing, I think we'll all be a little more grateful and, and a little less likely to take things for granted, like a, a hug from a grandchild or, or sharing a meal with friends or gathering together in community. So the idea behind this series is that we were, are going to begin to intentionally think about what we want to carry forward and what we want to leave behind. And a piece of this is discernment, which in the Christian context involves laying things out in prayer and then listening, which is where I want to start today. Our scripture this morning, it comes from the very heart of the Bible, from the Psalter. It's a psalm or a song that has been prayed by the community of faith over thousands of years. And it begins... To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Now, the word soul in the Hebrew language is nephesh, which also means neck. And, and that's, that's kind of weird, but if you think about it, here's your neck. It's this narrow passage that connects your head with your heart, right? It's, um, it's where all of your thoughts, your feelings, your food, your, your blood, your nerves, your gut feelings, your breath, all pass from one part of the body to the other. I mean, your soul is what holds your life together. It's a metaphor for your whole life. I love this psalm because it, it, there, there's just so much in it. I mean, it deals with just about every human emotion out there anger, feelings of guilt, the need for forgiveness. And by saying, I lift up my soul, we're saying, I'm literally handing you my life, my breath, all that I am, all that I feel. It's a profound description of prayer. I, I trust you with all of this. My worries, my concerns, uh, this, this confusing situation that I find myself in, I hand it all to you. In verse 4, the psalmist continues, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait. And then in verse 8, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. That's us, of course. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. 
Now, the psalmist who wrote this obviously believes that, that our faith offers a path, a way of life that's lived in tune or in harmony with the creator of the universe. He says that God instructs, God teaches, God leads. Now, if we believe this, I mean, if we accept this, then there is a sense of guidance and wisdom and peace, wholeness, that is really beyond reasoning things out, that, that we can't get from another self-help book or even a, another sermon, because it comes from waiting on God alone. But it does raise the question, how is God going to teach us? How is God going to, to lead us if we don't take time to listen? If we don't spend some time connecting to the source? C.S. Lewis had some powerful thoughts on all of this. He once wrote, the moment you wake up each morning, all of your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists on shoving it all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. I wonder if you were to pause for just a few moments each morning and, and take a few deep breaths and notice what it is that is stirring inside you. Notice what you're trying to come to grips with. What anxieties, what concerns? And what if in that reflection you were to ask, what do I want in my life? I mean, not money, not things, not experiences, but what do I really want? I mean, when I reflect on this, I want to be whole. I want to be centered. I want to be at peace with myself and with the world. I want meaningful relationships. I, wa I want to be able to make a contribution. But how often do we pause and reflect on all of this and then invite God to lead us? In his book, Out of Solitude, Henry Nouwen uh, writes about the importance of finding time apart, which he talks about as a lonely place. And I know I've shared this with you before, but we'll put it back up. He, he put it this way. Somewhere we know that without a lonely place, our lives are in danger. Somewhere we know that without silence, words lose their meaning. That without listening, speaking no longer heals. That without distance, closeness cannot cure. When you're able to create a lonely place, that is a time apart, in the middle of your actions and your concerns, then your successes and failures slowly can lose some of their power over you. It's in this solitude that we discover that being is more important than having and that we are worth more than the results of our efforts. And we are worth more even than our usefulness. I want to get practical here for just a moment. I mean, prayer in theory is one thing, but how do you make that a regular pattern, a guiding and shaping force in your life? A friend once told me that his spiritual discipline uh, is to turn off the radio whenever he's in the car alone, and that's his prayer time. Another friend with small children shared with me that uh, often first thing in the morning she would hide in her closet so she could have just 10 minutes alone in prayer. I remember my friend Roger Tompkins, who was an elder at Hodges Boulevard Presbyterian Church, telling me that he would walk through his neighborhood almost every day. And every day as he walks, he prays. 
This was, this was kind of a central part of his prayer life. And it's really not a bad idea. I remember when I was in seminary, one of my classes, uh, we were invited in that class to take a prayer walk through downtown Atlanta. And uh, we were to walk with our eyes tuned into the people and the situations all around us. And then, and then to pray for them as we went. And I remember as we walked, we saw a homeless man sleeping on a park bench. A group of businesswomen rushing back from lunch, laughing. We saw a group of children alive with energy playing in a park. We saw a woman digging through a dumpster, looking for her next meal. We saw police officers and moms and firefighters and construction workers. We also saw beautiful trees and birds. And I remember seeing a, the reflection of the sky with clouds passing by in the windows of glass windows of a large skyscraper. And as we reflected on the people around us, we prayed for them, asking for protection, for help, for daily bread, for grace, for hope. We also prayed for the city and for our nation and for the earth. I mean, the walk, it opened our eyes and opened our hearts. If you try this, while you walk, maybe even carry a question on your heart or a passage of scripture on which you can meditate and then repeat it over and over, asking God to speak to you through it. And then try to listen. You may notice in the bulletin, we've included some questions for reflection uh, with an invitation to journal. Use those if they seem helpful. Philip Yancey, he once told the story of a friend who uh, right at dusk went swimming in a, in a really large lake and he was about 100 yards offshore when a freak evening fog rolled in across the water. Suddenly his friend could see nothing. I mean, no horizon, no landmarks, uh, no objects or lights on the shore. And because the, the fog diffused the light, he couldn't even tell what direction the sun was setting in. Yancey writes that his friend splashed around in absolute panic. He would start off in one direction and then he would lose confidence. He would turn 90 degrees to the right or to the left. It made no difference which way he turned. He could feel his heart racing uncontrollably. He would stop and try to float and conserve energy and force himself to breathe slower. And then he would blindly strike out again. Finally, at last, he heard a faint voice calling, to, calling from the shore. He pointed his body toward the voice and followed it to safety. What a metaphor for our often frantic lives. I mean, often we wonder, what, what would God have us do next? What's the next right step for me to take? Or how do, how do I handle this confusing, scary situation I'm in? I mean, do we want to hear God's voice? Do we want to have God's healing and guidance at the heart of who we are? Do we want a sense of integrity between our faith and our work, between our faith and our family life? Then we need to make time to carve out this time and make it a priority. However it might look for you, may you pray with the psalmist to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. I hand you my worries, my concerns, my anxiety, my job, my family. Now, Lord, lead me, guide me, use me. May it be so. Amen.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe in a bright and amazing God who has been to the depths of despair on our behalf, who has risen in splendor and majesty, who decorates the universe with sparkling water, clear white light, twinkling stars and sharp colors over and over again. We believe that Jesus is the light of the world, that God believes in us and trusts us. We commit ourselves to Jesus, to one another as brothers and sisters, and to the Maker's business in the world. God said, let there be light. Amen. Please join me in prayer. You know, O oh God, how we have shaped our lives. You know what's important to us and where our hearts are. We want to be healthy and whole we want to live out of a deep experience of your grace and love. And so we ask you to draw us back to you, that we might again experience your peace. This morning, we pray for that peace for the world in which we live. When we look at the world around us, we see suffering and despair. And even in the midst of it all, great beauty and light we ask for your guiding spirit to rest on those who lead the nations. We ask your healing spirit to rest on those who are hurting, on those who are sick, and on those who are grieving. And we ask for your spirit of life to rest on us, your people, your family of faith. Give us hearts to care about what you care about. Help us to shape our lives in a way that brings meaning and hope to ourselves and to others in your name. Wash over us with your grace this day, even as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd like to make an offering, there are one of two ways you can do that. You can always just go on our website, and on the front page there is a link to give. If you follow that link, it's very simple. And of course, you can always just mail a check in to the church office. Our weekly offerings are the means by which our worship and all of our ministry and mission happen. And we give in response to God's love and mercy and grace. Gentle
Generous God, bless and multiply these tithes and offerings so that your ministry and mission through us would touch lives, change hearts, and deepen discipleship. In Christ's name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and every day. God loves you. Share that love and go in peace. Amen. <laughs>